Last thing we'll do in this unit is go over some of the aspects of relational databases that we won't cover in any detail. First off, the so-called security model of a database refers to how it handles security. And for most SQL databases, the gist is that the client, when it contacts the database server, has to log in and has to provide a username and a password. And associated with each user account in the database is a role which describes what kind of privileges uh, that user has, whether they can modify this table or read that table and, and so forth. And of course, this is all set up and controlled by users with special administrator privileges. Beyond that broad outline, the details of how security works in one database compared to the other tends to uh, vary significantly. It's something you pick up when you work with one particular database. What's called a view in a SQL database is a special kind of table. The normal tables in the database are called base tables. A view you can think of as a virtual table. It's a table which in a sense doesn't really exist because it doesn't have its own data. It's simply a view into other tables, into the regular base tables and possibly other view tables. And the way this works is you define a view and you simply define it by a query, a select statement. And so a view in effect is pretty much just an alias for some particular query. It's really not much more than that, though in most cases the database will allow you to modify the data of a view table, and what happens then when you update a row of a view table is that the actual row from the base table from which that uh, data was derived, that gets updated. So a view is not exactly just an alias for a certain query, but it's pretty close. Stored procedures in SQL are, in effect, basically functions within the SQL language. A stored procedure is just a list of statements to execute when that stored procedure is invoked by name. Now, stored procedures are one feature of SQL that's highly divergent. Some of the databases provide more features than others. In some, you can go as far as basically using SQL like a Turing complete language. It's like almost a full-fledged general purpose programming language. It's just a, a really, really awkward one. What's the point of having stored procedures? Well, uh, one major advantage, potentially, is that if you so choose, you can put all of the complex queries of your application into the database itself as stored procedures. That way, when your clients access the database, they don't have to send a whole bunch of SQL. They can just send very simple commands saying simply, call procedure X. And first off, that could spare your client and server from uh, exchanging quite a bit of network traffic, at least in the request. In the response, of course, the client still has to get back all the data. Another potential advantage is that by having the query predefined as a procedure in the database, the database can parse the SQL ahead of time and also optimize the query plan for those statements. It doesn't have to do that on the fly with each new request. And of course, the more complex the requests, the more overhead that saves. Another potential advantage of stored procedures is that they can, in effect, uh, serve to simplify the interface to the database. Rather than having the clients devise their own complex queries, they're just interacting through a set of predefined uh, queries by name. And you can actually configure security policy to enforce this. You can restrict clients to only using certain stored procedures and disallow them from making just arbitrary queries on your database. So stored procedures can also be a useful tool in security. Finally, one more potential advantage of using stored procedures is that stored procedures can do logic that's more complex than you can otherwise do with just regular queries. This is particularly the case when we use stored procedures in conjunction with another feature called cursors. Cursors are effectively iterators over result sets, result sets of queries. Using a cursor, a stored procedure can take the result set of some query and work through its data row by row or, or work with it in, in chunks of rows. So this allows the database to do more sophisticated kinds of processing on data than it otherwise could do. Indexes in SQL are an important tool of optimization. We attach an index to some column, and what the database then does is it creates an index of the values in that column, uh, allowing for faster lookup. So for example, if in your queries you're going to be searching for particular ID values within some table, some you know, the primary key ID values, it'd be a good idea to put an index on that primary key, and that will allow the database to find particular rows with a particular ID much faster, because otherwise, without those indexes, the database would have to scan through the entire table to find the rows you want, and scanning through a whole table can take a, quite a lot of time, especially as more and more rows are added. 
Indexes can also be used to provide for faster sorting of a table. Say we have a table of people that includes their names, and we want to generally access this table in alphabetical order. It would be a good idea then to create an ordered index for the name column in that table, and the database can then use that index to do a quick sorting on that column when it needs to. Indexes are another part of SQL databases that are highly divergent, so you'll find that the way they work exactly in Postgres differs significantly from how they work in, say, Microsoft SQL Server. A trigger in SQL refers to some code, generally a stored procedure, which is automatically executed in the database upon the occurrence of some event, like, say, some particular row being updated. There are all sorts of potential uses for triggers. The most common, though, I would say, is to preserve the integrity of the data in the database. Like, say, when a value in this column gets updated or a row in this table gets deleted, that means we have to also change this other thing. Of course, that's the sort of thing you could enforce in your application code, the, the client talking to the database. Sometimes, though, that's not adequate, and you want the database to enforce these kinds of integrity rules itself. So that's where triggers come in. Be clear that SQL is not really a protocol. When a client connects to a database, it doesn't just open up a TCP socket and start spouting SQL at the server. That won't work because there's more to the protocol. Like, say, when a connection is made, we have to authenticate ourselves. We have to log in with the username and password, and that's not a part of SQL. So, you may ask, what is the standard protocol used by databases? And the answer is, well, there really isn't one. Instead of having a standard protocol, the solution devised was a standard API, so to speak, what's called the Open Database Connectivity Standard, ODBC. So in an application, we use the ODBC library available for that language and platform, and the ODBC library is then responsible for translating that into the appropriate protocol for the database. Now, again, different databases have different protocols, so what you also need is what's called an ODBC driver. These drivers are basically plugins to the ODBC library, and each one enables ODBC to talk to a different database. So, for example, if I'm working in Python and I want to talk to Postgres, we would need first an OBC module for Python, and then we'd need an ODBC driver for Postgres. And understand that the ODBC standard is specified in C. So an ODBC library and the drivers it uses are always written in C. So because they're in C and therefore compiled to native code, you need to make sure that the uh, library and driver are compiled for your platform. And if you're using some language other than C, you need some way of invoking the C code from your own non-C code. In Python, this is not a big problem because Python makes it easy to call C code from Python. In other languages, though, it's a bigger issue, like say in Java. In fact, for the sake of Java, an alternative standard was developed called JDBC, J obviously as in Java. Java database connectivity is really the same idea as open database connectivity, just written to run on the Java runtime rather than written in C. You'll find that there are freely available JDBC drivers for all of the most popular databases, but for some of the more obscure databases, there may not be any JDBC driver available, so the solution there is to use what's called a JDBC to ODBC bridge, which, as the name implies, takes the method calls you make using the JDBC API and translates those invocations into calls to an underlying ODBC library. So that's a solution for the scenario where you're using Java, but the database you want to connect to only has an ODBC driver, not any JDBC driver.